That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I have the privilege of um, uh, spending a couple of days with Alan and Judy, and it is a, a, an amazing experience. Um, and I think that's uh, a beautiful piece. Um, but then I would, wouldn't I? Um, now, I want to talk about the uh, care of children outside the home by non-parental uh, practitioners. Notice the careful avoiding the use of the word caregiver. Uh, a daycare practitioner. Now, to my mind, <clears throat> and the research that I've managed to find in, uh, from anthropology, mothers have always worked. For millions of years, mothers have worked. It's a no-brainer. Humans did not evolve in a suburban house with 2.4 kids and dad out to work. That is not how we made it. We made it with everybody in a social, emotional, uh, reciprocal interactions. And that included mother, or the primary attachment figure, uh, having to do a lot of work. The real question that I'm curious about is what was the quality of the relationship that the child had with the daycare practitioner, for want of a better word, um, when mother was not available? Was this an enduring, stable, secondary attachment relationship that the child had with this person, somebody like a grandmother, or elder sibling, or aunt? Or was it with a stranger? And we defined a stranger this morning, where there was no attachment. Let's just think about this normal process called separation anxiety, okay? It's a normal process. It always happens. But normal doesn't necessarily mean good. I'll give you an illustration of another normal process. I put my hand in the fire and I hold it there. The normal process will be it gets burnt and the result will be blisters and maybe a scar. But that may be a single event trauma and I never do it again, just like you never got lost again, just like you didn't lose your child again. We have to bear in mind that normal does not mean good. It just means it is predictable and expected. Now, I find this, that was just 11 seconds. I'm now going to show you something which is just a piece of paper that I was handed. It was this piece of paper. It was a visiting card that a woman sh uh, showed me uh, two or three years ago. This is from the Girls' Heritage Hospital. Children in hospital may be visited on the first Sunday in each month by their parents or two visitors. Time, 3 o'clock to 4.30. 1950, about 1951. That was best practice. That's what we thought was appropriate. This woman had had polio as a child. She's been in hospital for a year. She was visited once a month for an hour and a half. And if there had been any illness at home, the visit would be cancelled. Now, James Robertson made a film about a two-year-old going to hospital, a two-year-old called Laura. Anybody seen that film? Yeah, quite a lot of you. And uh, Joyce Robertson, by the way, his wife, his widow, is still alive and kicking. And I've shown her this paper. So I find, now this, we've seen 11 seconds. Now we've seen month by month over a period of a year and is deeply distressing. Uh, the, the, the effect was profound.
I'm going to read you a little, a little passage from a booklet that I've got here. The booklet's called, Can I Leave My Baby? And it's written by John Bowlby. Price one shilling and sixpence. 1958 takes you back. Mothers sometimes ask, then can we never leave our small children? I do not believe that anyone has ever suggested that they should not. It's an excellent plan to accustom babies and small children to being cared for now and then by someone else. Father, for instance, or granny, or some other relation or neighbour. What has he just listed? Likely secondary attachment figures. May or may not be securely attached, but secondary attachment figures. I'll go over them again. Father, for instance, or granny, or some other relation or neighbour. That's what he was listing. He didn't group them under secondary attachment figures. He often used the term subsidiary attachment figures. Leaving a small child whilst you go out to work needs much more care. If your own mother is living nearby, or a dependable neighbour can be daily guardian, it may work out all right. But it needs regularity, and it must be the same person who cares for him. And he's listing there, if your own mother is living nearby, uh, and as this is for aimed at mothers, this would mean the maternal grandmother, which is the classic uh, secondary attachment figure, which I experienced when being raised in my grandmother's house. Then he goes on about nannies. Nannies are valuable people, provided they're good ones, and provided they stay. I may say, provided they stay, it's in italics, it's the only bit that was. Uh, this is autobiographical. Uh, it's the chopping and changing of people in charge of a young child which upsets him. And if a mother hands over her baby completely to a nanny, she should realise that in her child's eyes, nanny will be the real mother figure and not mummy. But for a child to be looked after entirely by a loving nanny, and then for her to leave when he's two or three, or even four or five, can be almost as tragic as the loss of a mother. And that's my father's story. So he's not against non-parental, out-of-home daycare. But he is listing quite precisely the sort of people, the sort of relationship that those sort of people would have had, is how I'm interpreting his words. So this is the halfway house. This is halfway between 11 seconds and months at a time over a period of a year. And I'm a patron of a day center, a children's day center. I'm a patron of various childminder coordinator organizations. These are people whose job it is, whose task it is, is to care for people, other people's children during the day. And they know their attachment theory and they develop secondary attachment, they allow the baby to form a secondary attachment to them or the toddler before they are left with them. So there is no protest. I'll read you the beginning of a, uh, a, just a brief paper. I might be able to read you a bit more than just the beginning. When babies and toddlers younger than about 30 months are daily cared for by people they love and with whom they have developed a secondary attachment such as father, grandmother, childminder or nanny. There are usually positive outcomes. But when babies and toddlers are cared for by unfamiliar people to whom they are not attached and when they are unable to reach any of their established attachment figures, then babies and toddlers will sense danger and feel afraid. And they'll sense danger because they can't reach safety. It's not that there's anything potentially dangerous or abusive or neglectful even. It's just that at the attachment level, a baby of about a year old cannot find safety. That's at an emotional level. The fear continues until they are reunited with an attachment figure, preferably with their primary attachment figure, who is usually, but not necessarily, their birth mother. Now, of course, it's most common that the birth mother is the primary attachment figure. 
but it's not always, and it's important to recognise, and that's why we try to stick to the terminology. When cared for by strangers for several hours a day in unfamiliar surroundings with no access to any of their attachment figures, most babies and toddlers eventually become so overwhelmed by fear that their psychological defences are activated and they shut down emotionally. Without an attachment figure, some become aggressive and disruptive. That's the form of fight reflex. Whilst others stop crying and become withdrawn or overcompliant, which is more of a freeze or surrender process. But these are often mistakenly seen as being the easy ones who settle in well. I believe the daily periods of attachment deprivation in the presence of strangers constitutes a significant degree of emotional neglect that may be a contributing factor to the mental health and educational problems of today's troubled children. Throughout human evolution, women have worked and been helped in raising their babies and toddlers. But until the 1960s and 70s, the people helping would mostly have been family or friends whom the babies and toddlers had grown to love as secondary attachment figures. Seeking proximity to an attachment figure is a specific behaviour that becomes highly activated when there is no attachment figure accessible. The absence of attachment figure is sensed as increasing the risk of danger and it triggers feelings of fear, which we sometimes call separation anxiety, but that's at an intense level. That's not separation anxiety that you saw in the strange situation procedure. That was simply activating the attachment-seeking behaviour. That was not a separation anxiety, which continues until they are reunited with an attachment figure. Although the importance of the primary attachment relationship has been known for many years, it's only recently been recognised that in order to avoid emotional neglect, babies and toddlers always need access to someone they love an established secondary attachment figure. And it's not good enough for the practitioner to say, but I love the baby. The question is, does the baby love you? And that's a different deal. Um, in the UK, we've recently had new legislation, uh, generally termed the Early Years Foundation Stage. And the Early Years Foundation Stage has a poster that goes with it. And if we look at the purple passage, it's about positive relationships. And the term that is used for a secondary attachment figure is the child's key person. Not a key worker, a key person. And the first item here is secure attachment. Now it has been legislated that the baby must have a secure attachment to the key person in order to be cared for outside the home. And if it hasn't, you're breaking the law. <laughs> now, it's become a tick box exercise. One lady phoned me up. She said, my baby's just, my six-month-old has just started day nursery, daycare, in the children's centre. And in the first five days, my baby's had three different key people. What do I do? get them out. And she did. It's not good enough. Just because you've done the legislation and the government can say, well, we, we told you what to do. If you're not doing it, that's your problem. So be careful what you wish for. Now, the thing about what I've just been telling you is that we have a lot of evidence and we have no proof. Okay? Read my lips. We do not have the proof. Getting proof in this game is excruciatingly difficult. There have been big studies who've looked at the big one in America, the biggest, the NICHD study of daycare, and Jay Belsky is one of the lead authors, and I recently asked him what was the quality of the relationship that the babies had with their carer, with their practitioner, in the absence of the of, of the primary attachment figures during the day? And the answer, sadly, was, we don't know because we didn't measure it.
So how do you help a baby form a secondary attachment? Quickly. Quick as you can. What's the quickest you can manage to get a baby form a secondary attachment? I asked a lovely old lady who had done this lots and lots of times. And she said, well, the first thing that you need is you need a baby who expects to make relationships easily. You need a securely attached baby. <laughs> so um, she, wouldn't, she doesn't deal with babies under six months because that's the period when the baby is developing that primary attachment and she doesn't want to mess with that. So, that's the first thing. Now you've got to start a few little tricks. We heard about miscuing the parents, how some children will appear to be easy babies, like the one, the insecure one there who didn't cry. Uh, now we're going to miscue the child. A benign technique, but one that is quite clever. The first time that the baby meets the new practitioner, it's in the baby's own home with mum. So the baby is in a good place at home with mum, and we're going to assume this is a securely attached baby. Practitioner walks into the house, comes into the house, and in the presence of the baby, the mother and the practitioner greet one another as long lost relatives. So the baby is being cued, oh my goodness, this is just another of mum's guys. These are the, what she always does to the people that I get to know really well. So you're miscuing the child that this is okay, and I may say you do it when you, when you leave. Whatever the mother's normal procedure is for these greetings and um, departures uh, for close family, um, and you're just uh, miscuing the child. Um, now, we're going to have to speed this thing up. So the next thing that happens is that the mum comes to the practitioner's accommodation, and usually in this case it's the practitioner's own home, and the mum accompanies the baby. The practitioner's home is becoming a familiar location instead of a strange location, but it's going to be done in the presence of mum. So initially the baby is going to be a little bit reluctant to engage, but over the days, because this is going to be frequent and regular, it's going to take about a month, so frequent and regular, mum comes along with the baby, the practitioner doesn't have to provide any, any care because that's being done by mum. Uh, once the practitioner is familiar and the location is familiar, the next thing is you've got to start trying to help the baby recognise that the practitioner can terminate the attachment-seeking response because they are becoming an attachment figure. And you start by uh, very small moves where uh, momentarily the mother might just um, uh, go into the next room, pick up a cup of coffee and come straight back. Just momentarily be out of sight. Just a little, because what you don't want to do is to trigger that reaction that you saw when the baby saw the mother leave the room. You want, because you want the baby to feel this is a, as a secure place, I know where I am, sort of, it's okay, been okay so far, and they anticipate that it'll be. So if, they, if you can get past that one without the baby crying, then, or protesting like we saw, then you're in a good place to extend that and slowly build on it. And what you've got to do eventually is you've got to keep, get mum out of the space, because whenever the child is distressed, they go back to mum. And you've got to get them to, to, under, to, to, to recognize that this other person can be a secondary attachment figure. And what you're trying to do is to provide an alternative attachment figure to terminate the child's attachment-seeking response in the absence of mum. So they don't feel lost. And if I was a filmmaker and I wanted a piece of nice, pretty uh, footage that I needed to lay down on the... On the um, uh, video so that I had enough time to talk the next piece of information that was coming. I would need a baby that wasn't going to scream and scream and scream because I needed a silent soundtrack. So I would probably ask, anybody got a good baby? <laughs> and I guess this uh, mother, who I'm sure is a very, very good mother, um, would say something like, yeah, I've got a good baby, he'll go to anybody. 
Now at that age, all the alarm bells start ringing. Any baby who within two or three weeks would settle quickly and appear to be uh, fully attached, clingy almost. This is an unusual. This is, this is not what we would anticipate as being an appropriate way for a, a well-attached uh, baby to behave. Um, an illustration of how this can work out. Um, it came about uh, a couple of years ago when I finally decided to go public with my anxieties, my fears, and, to, and which you have just been party to. And I approached a major British national newspaper, uh, and I wanted to get the story published. And they put a young reporter on to me, and he said, so, what's all this about then? Does a baby need one-to-one -one care? So I said, well, no, not really. I mean, one person could look after more than one child. He said, so, what's it all about then? And I said to him, do you ever get lost? And he said, yeah, I did. I said, where were you? He said, I was on the beach. I said, how old were you? He said, I was three. I said, how long did you get lost for? He said, three hours. I said, wow, what did that feel like? He said, it was terrifying, the most frightening experience of my life. I said, well, that's what a baby would feel like if they were left in a day nursery, in an unfamiliar location, first day, with an unfamiliar practitioner, without access to their attachment figure, they felt lost. He said, well, I've got three children. My eldest is 14, and she's a lovely girl. And when my wife went back to work, we, we had a childminder. So I said, do you ever see the childminder? And he said, yes, she's part of the family now. So I said, well, that would be a secondary attachment figure, because that is what you would expect. And then he said, for our second child, my wife went back to work three days a week, and the baby was cared for by her mother. So I said, well, the maternal grandmother is the all-time classic secondary attachment figure. Then there's a pause, and he said, my third child was in day nursery, and he's been a constant source of anxiety ever since. I said, oh dear. And then he said, what do you want me to write? And he got a front page headline. Now, I felt pretty anxious about sticking my head above the parapet, as you can imagine. And I've tried to take you through very gradually what it is to be separated for 11 seconds, for a year. Now we have to look at this difficult time in between. Anything from uh, a few minutes to several hours on a repeated process each day. Where there is a secondary attachment, I don't think there's ever been a problem. I think there's a bonus. I think there's a benefit. I mean, it's well attested that if, there are, if a child has three or more secondary attachment figures, they have a protective factor. Not only does everybody love me, but if mum isn't around, I've got someone else to go to. And one of the most isolating, high-risk situations is a dyad of mother, single mother, unsupported socially, emotionally, and financially, a single mother with an only child. That is a very, very tough deal. So it is not a question of just mother being with baby. It is the whole package. And in our society, we've tended to fragment the package. I think that's the best way of putting it. Um, Stephen Sumi has taken over um, the... Uh, primate research center that uh, was started um, uh, all those years ago um, for, for, for monkey research by Harry Harlow. And I asked Stephen, did you ever do a day nursery simulation for, the, for, for monkeys? And he said, yes, we did. And he wrote to me. He said, we tried a daycare simulation study some years ago with the intent of having infant rhesus spend four hours a day 
away from their mothers, in the presence of several other separated infants, and an elderly substitute caregiver female rhesus. But the daily separations of infants from mothers were so obviously stressful on the infants, the mothers, and our staff alike, that we quickly abandoned the project. I suppose we might have succeeded if we had been more clever and or persistent, but I made the decision it was not worth the effort or the stress on everybody. Now, I think that some of the most observant uh, academics and scientists are the ethologists, those people who study animal behavior. Um, and uh, he was studying monkeys, they're not humans. But my guess is there is a very, very, very similar parallel impact. And he was able to observe in great detail and record it and analyze it to see how this was going. And it's something we have difficulty in getting cameras into day nurseries to do academic research, to study all the behaviors of the children, the parents, the, the daycare practitioners on an intimate, detailed basis. Well, I'm going to leave you, I think, at that point. Um, and to discuss, we've got a few minutes, we can have some more afterwards, but we'll, we've got 10 minutes now. I'm very happy to try to answer any questions, same deal as last time. Um, but you can see that this is, um, it is very difficult to talk about this subject because it has so many powerful impacts on our lives. But if anybody has got any thoughts or questions, a question here in the front. You may have to shout. Okay. Oh, we got a microphone coming, a radio mic coming. Bring it round. Do you sit on? Feel like there's any kind of a dose effect on children differently if they have a secure attachment with their mother and, a, and an insecure attachment with their, or you know, primary attachment figure? Is is there? you know, for the, for the child that's in care six to eight hours a day, and they go home to a secure attachment. Is that different than if they go home to an insecure in terms of their overall? These, no one studied this. This is a closed, this is largely a closed book. Um, the NICHD study looked at the quality of the relationship that the baby had with the primary attachment figure over a period of time but they never looked at the impact that the quality of the relationship in daycare might have, might have induced. For instance, what they did look at was the number of, of um, daycare, um, daycare, not providers, arrangements. They looked at the number of daycare arrangements that the child had had in the first 12 months, second and third 12 months. And sometimes there was one arrangement that the child had, and sometimes two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 different arrangements in a 12-month period that the child had had. But because of this need for statistical analysis, they truncated the 95th centile, and they removed the top 5%. So they don't even show. They're just gone. And they're the ones which I think are the most... But the reality is that the child who's had a single arrangement may be a single day nursery. And if you ask the question, what was the name of the person who cared for the baby in the absence of the primary attachment figure, the answer is often, we don't know, because it could have been anybody. And it's very unlikely, if that's the answer, that anyone is going to have a secure attachment. People sometimes say, surely to God, Richard, it's better that the child has a, some sort of day nursery than be stuck at home with a depressed mum who's got all sorts of other social and emotional issues. And I say, well, yeah, I mean, if the child can form a stable, enduring, secondary attachment where they can develop a, an internal model that these things are possible because they've experienced them, they may not be what we got at home, but they are a functioning of what we've had, then this can be a reparative model. But if the child who is having a tough time at home and is insecure and doesn't expect to make relationships easily 
is left shut down without access to a new relationship because there's a agency staff, students, new members of staff, revolving door care that some of these day nurseries have, which I may say is what this young uh, journalist turned out because we checked out the particular one. It was one of a chain of 100 commercial day nurseries. And I'm not saying they're all wrong, but that was what that one was. So it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma. And we don't have all the data. Again, a lot of evidence, no proof. Um, am I wrong to raise my anxieties? Or should we start again? Well, let's start another 22-year longitudinal study. We'll take another 1,000 babies, take another 22 years. Or have we got enough information that we can raise our anxieties? I'm wondering if, let's say, there is a single parent. A single uh, parent, yeah. A single parent, male or female. Um, they have a secure attachment or seem to have a secure attachment with their parent. Yeah. Um, they may have formed maybe possibly an insecure attachment with their secondary figure. Yeah. Do they later have issues forming other attachments? No. No. Okay. I was wondering. It's well attested that babies can form a secure attachment with one attachment figure and an insecure attachment with the other. Good question. It's a quality of an individual relationship, not a quality of the child. Uh, what tends to happen, though, is that the quality of the attachment relationship with the primary attachment figure is the one that they first make the assumption that it's likely as to how things are going to work out. But the fact that they may have had a secure attachment with a secondary attachment figure or an insecure attachment with a secondary attachment figure does not carry the same weight of expectation. Uh, and if it's a secure secondary, an insecure primary, the child can use the alternative strategy. And I, to a certain extent, I tended to use my father-in-law, who I would say was securely attached, as a person uh, when I got married and was raising children, rather than the model of my father, who was insecure avoidant. I loved my father. We lived, you know, I lived next door to him, and we shared a sailboat. I got on well with him. But he had difficulty showing his emotions, where my father-in-law didn't. So I thought, wow, that's cute. I, I like that. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, these things are. Uh, we need, after that one, we've got a question at the front here. OK, thank you. So <clears throat> in question in three parts, but it's the same question. How do you measure in a concrete relationship if there is attachment, the quality of the attachment? In practice, how would you measure it? How, how, hang, how do you measure insecure attachment? You have a child and an adult. How do you measure the quality of that attachment? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry that you missed this morning's paper um, because uh, we were looking at the, the strange situation procedure that you've just seen and how you can have a rating protocol which... Uh, from seeing the strange situation and rating the quality of the reunion and how rapidly the child reverts to active play. Uh, and this is a protocol which is very carefully, and it's been done thousands of times. The other, though, for adults or older children, adolescents, is the adult attachment interview, which is looking at the quality of discourse that the, ch that the, pra that the um, adult has when discussing what can be very touching and moving experiences. And I'd love to and tell, how, tell how, you. How is the measure validated? How do we know that that procedure is measuring what we want to measure? I'll tell you about it. It's a, it's a research protocol that's actually just won the Nobel Prize. Now, you may not know that there is no Nobel Prize for psychology, but every other year there are the alternative Nobel Prizes. And Mary Main got the alternative Nobel Prize 10 years ago for the adult attachment interview from the King of Sweden at Uppsala University with the same uh, protocol, but no money, no name. Uh, it's, a major, it's a major piece of work. It's, it's complicated. It's a research protocol. It is not 
a therapeutic protocol. And Curiously, it has a therapeutic impact when you do do it, but it's not used. It's a, it's, it, it's a fascinating thing. Surprising the unconscious, and it's the coherence of narrative. It's not what they say, it's how they say it. They're looking for the Freudian slips, and it's, it's, it's been uh, replicated, it's been validated, it's been torn to shreds, it's been put back together again, and it does seem to work. About 80% predictive, not 100%, just, but 80%. This, this is very quick. How does the British law that you mentioned, yes. that has criminal punishment associated, presumably, or, or civil punishment, measures the quality of an attachment? If I'm a UK citizen and I say... They've got nothing. I say, so it doesn't bite. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a real problem. It's a paper exercise. Yeah. How can we support forming healthy secondary attachments with infants? Well, first you become friends. It's called being, becoming, first you become familiar. You become friends. And that takes a bit of time. Then you move on and you start to develop. You start to push the child towards forming an attachment. Um, but it's got to be sensitive. What you must do is trigger this reaction um, of fear, fight and flight when the child protests. And you, that's, so that's the, that's, that's the balancing point. And you can test for that very briefly just by, by going out of the room to get a cup of coffee and coming back again. So it's a, um, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an art. It's not a science. It's an art. It's a skill. It requires experience and training and understanding what you're trying to do. I mean, it's a good question, and it's not easy, and that's why I used a bit of time to show that. Time for one more question. One of the... Uh, you at the very back. I'm wondering, with this same effect, in translate to... I'm wondering if the same effect would translate to a three-year-old who has had a primary caregiver, be it... and possibly even a secondary caregiver, but is now their secondary caregiver is gone, yes. their primary caregiver is still there, but they're going to preschool. Because most preschools, as I understand it, want parents to drop the kid off and leave, not stay. And I'm wondering what the effect is of that. Now, um, Steve Bidolf referred to uh, slammers and sliders. <laughs> he doesn't like the slammers. He likes the sliders. You slide a child in gradually. And if that means the mom hanging around and sh short days for the first day or two, slightly longer days, mom beginning to make the departure, but at around two years and nine months, by about the third birthday, most children's neurological development and their, their uh, capacity for planning and memory uh, and uh, future future planning strategies, mum did come back, mum will come back, I've got three word speech, I'm coming more left brain, uh, and I can actually manage without having the uh, proximity of an attachment figure if I have the trust, if I can build up the trust that this place feels reasonably safe. And although it's a bit scary, I can manage it because I can hold, and it, it, I hold my primary attachment figure in mind, which is a bit different from simple object permanence. You have a little toy, you put it under a cover, you take it out. It's a bit different when it's mother's presence or absence. Object permanence, because some people use the term object for, 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 for a mother. And I don't like the term object. Mother isn't an object. Um, and this is sort of a Kleinian Freudian sort of thing. So, I, for, so that's okay. I've run over time. Uh, my OCD. I'm a minute over. Thank you very much. <laughs>